Most people long for freedom. Few, if any, actually choose tyranny or bondage. Yet as William Penn and other American founders identified, those who refuse to voluntarily submit themselves to the Ten Commandments of God will ultimately experience the heavy hand of tyranny. Hello and welcome to part two of this eighth principle in our ten-part series of Principles for a Renewed Nation. I'm Sam Rohr and I'll be joined in just a moment by Isaac Crockett. For freedom to continue, good laws are required, and that requires good lawmakers. Penn summed it up this way in his 1682 frame of government. He said this, quote, governments, like clocks, go from the motion men give them. And as governments are made and moved by men, so by them they are also ruined. Wherefore, governments rather depend upon men than men upon governments. He said, let men be good, meaning righteous, and the government cannot be bad. If it be ill, they will cure it, but if men be bad, let the government be ever so good, they will endeavor to warp and spoil it in their turn. He goes on to say, I know some say, well, let us have good laws and no matter for the men that execute them. But let them consider that though good laws do well, good men do better. For good laws may lack good men and be abolished or evaded, but good men will never lack good laws nor suffer ill ones. He said, it's true, good laws have some awe upon ill ministers, but that's where they have not the power to escape or abolish them, and the people are generally wise and righteous. But a loose and depraved people, he said, and that's the question, those depraved people love laws and an administration like themselves. He said, therefore, that which makes for a good societal construction, constitution, he called, he said, must keep it, that is, men of wisdom and virtue, qualities that because they descend not with worldly inheritances must be carefully propagated by a virtuous Christian education of the youth. Well, in part two of the citizen's duty to government and office, we'll address today the importance of good laws requiring good lawmakers. And then later in the program, good and just government requires the understanding that those in government operate as God's servants or God's ministers, as identified in Romans 13. So Isaac, again, we're going to, this is a, a, an immense topic. We could, we could, you and I could teach and preach on this for, for a long time, but Penn made the point, I referenced there in a the quote, that governments are like clocks. They go from the motion that men give them. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a, an interesting image. Can you give an example, a biblical passage or something that actually supports exactly what he was saying there? Right, yeah, and his object lesson of a clock, that technology that they had back then, we still have. Uh, we have, you know, on our wrist watches. And then we have computers, too, and these computer programmers program computers. When you type something into a calculator or into a computer program, you get out of it only as much as has been programmed into it. And so our laws can only be good when they're done by good people with good intentions. Um, I think it's a passage we've used a couple of times uh, here of late uh, in a passage I recently put on my Twitter uh, feed is Proverbs 29. Um, Proverbs 29.2 is uh, very clear and it, it talks about um, you know, not hardening your neck to God's word and justice that God brings and His ways and His virtue. But it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. And it's, it's that simple. You can see when the good people are doing good things, rejoicing. When the bad people are in charge, they're going to do bad things, there's grieving, there's mourning. Um, you kind of you know, get into it, what you get out of it, and especially in a government like ours, a republic, it's that much more important. It's so important that we have godly citizens involved because we will make, uh, the leadership will come from the 
the citizenship. So it's not, you know, just inherited from one family, uh, or, or it shouldn't be, <laughs> at least. So a, a lot more to go on from this, but the Bible is clear, and the Bible, um, it, it sounds so simple, uh, what, what it's saying here, but yet there's so much involved with it. So we're going to take a, a brief time out. We're going to come back and discuss this topic even more and look at how important it is that you and I, uh, that we are faithful to the Word of God as a good citizenship um, brings forth good leaders of this nation. We'll be right back. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Uh, Isaac, I want to go back to what um, you were just talking about and I asked you in that last segment. And that is about having the righteous in authority. Mm -hmm. uh, I quoted some things from Penn. He said, good laws. He referred to, he used the word good uh, a lot. Good laws, good people, good government. Uh, as we've done many times, uh, if somebody were to go and to look at the uh, Webster's 1829 Dictionary, which was really the dictionary that would define terms that were used at that point, they would find that good is, was often interchanged with righteous. Mm -hmm. So righteous laws, righteous government, uh, that changes. So when we think good, we think righteous. But let's go back here a little bit because just build out, if you can, how, how does it actually... Uh, What's the, what's the connection without directly to, um, for instance, God blessing a nation or judging a nation and having righteous leaders in office and therefore the people rejoicing, or as you quoted, when the evil, the not righteous, are in government, the people mourn. Link the power of that principle because that's, that's extraordinarily strong. Um, yeah, I was recently uh, in my devotions was going through kind of a study on Deuteronomy, and it's such a neat book because this is kind of Moses' last hurrah, his last chance to really talk to his people uh, before they're going to be separated. They're going to go into the promised land. He knows he's about to die. It's not the same, but sort of like as a parent, you, maybe when your kids are going off to the grandparents' house or somewhere, you know, or just out somewhere, even on your way to church. All right, kids, now remember what we talked about, you know, we, and you're reviewing this. This wasn't necessarily new information, but he was emphasizing this information they already knew. You get to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and it talks about how God will bless Israel. Um, he says, uh, the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations if you will you know, obey him. Uh, then it talks about going into the land of plenty and this blessing. And then you get you know, partway through the chapter and he talks about the curses that are there if you disobey God. So, you know, hey kids, um, if you do well, you know, here's the good things. If you disobey, remember the consequences. Remember, you know, maybe punishment or whatever that's coming. And he actually tells them that if they don't obey his commandments, they just leave alone, they ignore it, that all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And how important is it for us to realize that today, that when we ignore the word of God, and we take it and we set it aside for our own ways. It's exactly like you said, good, uh, right, wrong. Good and bad is the same as right and wrong. And where do, if we start trying to come up with that on our own, we've lost our way. We have to return to the Word of God to find what is good, what is right, and what does God want us to do. And, and that helps us to go forth from there. Which, um, as we kind of work through that, the other side of the coin, so to speak, with Penn talking about good lawmakers making good laws is the, the position that they are in. They are in a position of authority, of, of separate, extra, special authority. Our lawmakers 
And how important is it for them as, as governing you know, civil leaders to understand this authority that they've been given, not to just fall into it sort of accidentally. None of this happened by accident. How important is it uh, for those that, that are chosen that they realize this is a role from God, authority you know, that God is giving to me um, and a duty in this office uh, to do right? Um, well, Isaac, again, it brings us back to a biblical worldview. If someone doesn't have any biblical concept of who God is and how God functions, the last program we talked about the how God, the Godhead is together as God the judge, God the lawmaker, God the king. Mm -hmm. That's God, one, totally unified, but in, but in different capacities they yield to each other, submit to God the Father, and they work together. That's the picture of God's design for earthly society and, and, and authority. So when the individual does in self-government, relates in himself to God and obeys the Ten Commandments and does, fears God and keeps His commandments, and the mom and dad in the home do that with their children and teach them, and those in church authority do that, and then those in civil authority do that, all under God, all of a sudden it works like a beautiful song. But when anybody throws that off and says, I don't care who God is, they're now in rebellion. Or I'm not going to do what God says, they're now in rebellion. And when that happens, then you just read from Deuteronomy, the justice of God will step in. He says, you obey me, I will bless you, the mercy and the grace of God. But if you defy me, then the justice of God says there are consequences to your bad choices. So here again, everything we're talking about last time and this time. But let me read something else. I read, uh, I read a while ago from a quote from William Penn. Let me just share it with you here right now. I think this is, this is great. Again, Penn is talking here to those in office. He's given him a charge and he says this, consider your commission and examine the extent of your authority, and you will find that God has empowered you to punish certain sins. He's going to name them. And he said, and this is your duty. We just, we talked about where duty and honor comes from, from the character of God. He said, he said now this is not troubling for men, uh, men of faith, nor perplexing for people of tender conscience. For there can be no pretense of conscience to be drunk, he's naming some sins now, to be drunk, to whore, to be voluptuous, to gamble, to swear, curse, blaspheme, and profane, no such matter, he said. He said, these are sins against nature, and they're also sins against government, as well as against the written laws of God. These sins lay the axe to the root of human society, and they are the common enemies of mankind. To prevent these enormities, government was instituted. We covered that in one of the principles, number four, uh, the purpose of government. And government shall encourage, shall not government encourage that which is instituted? In other words, to, to do this? He said, this would be to render government and those in government as useless and the bearing of the sword in vain. If there was no speaking out against these sins, he's saying. He said, there could be no such thing in government as a terror to evildoers but everyone would do that which was right in their own eyes. He said, God defend us. May God Almighty defend us from this sort of anarchy. Isaac, it's an extraordinary thing, because when I go to Romans 13, where the Apostle Paul lays out the concept of authority, and we've dealt with this in earlier programs, God's idea of authority, and he ranks authority. Uh, and that's what it means, ordained authority, it's all ranked. He uses the concept, and what Penn's for talking to here, is that every person in government in a position of authority is identified as a minister of God. It says, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. That minister of God is the word we get the word uh, deacon from, it's diakonos. It means a servant. Literally every person in a position of authority, including civil government, is a servant of God. Now the question is, do they understand that? 
Are they actually executing their duties in government, praising those who do well, punishing those who do evil, enacting justice as we talked about in the last program, based on God's truth, eyes covered so that it's being, everyone's being treated equally, truth on one hand, mercy on the other. If they are doing that, leading to the praising of those who do well righteously and punishing according to God's justice those who do evil, they then they will do that if they understand that they are God's ministers because God will hold them accountable. But the Scripture tells us all the way through the New Testament, pray for those in positions of authority because they watch for your souls. So if in a position of authority God will hold every one of them accountable, and then in verse 6 it says, for those, for those in the office, those positions of authority, they are God's ministers, and they said, a, a, attending continually upon this very thing. I encourage people to go there and look at it because the use of that word God minister there, Isaac, is a different Greek word. It's like turgos, and it, lit, and it literally means leader in worship. Every person in a position of authority, be as you described before, the father or mother in the home, the teacher in the classroom, the employer, the, people, the leadership in church, leadership in government, every aspect should be, as what that says, to call attention to the God of heaven. They're leaders in worship. So when justice is, enunci is, is, is carried out, when a person in, in an authority speaks, makes law, executes law, the, the duty of that person in office is to understand that they're not there for themselves. They are there on behalf of the God of heaven following His commands. When that's done, then the decisions they make will be, as you read from Deuteronomy, good, and God will bless the nation. And if they don't, then God will punish that nation. It's that simple. The duties of those in office, they're, em they're, they're enormous, but it's all from here. Let me go back here to Romans 3. I'm talking about it here just a little bit. Um, when God, this example here is a person in office operating as a obedient minister of God, a deacon of God, which then allows them to be a servant of the people. But the Scripture also talks about and gives examples of uh, people in office who were not mm -hmm. that way, humble and servants. They were arrogant and proud. Give us an example because that's all the way through Scripture. Well, um, and, and I, I like um, this word that you brought us back to, minister. And I grew up uh, in the Midwest and family in the South, and so a lot of times pastor was referred to as a pastor or a preacher, but here in Pennsylvania when I came here to start pastoring, the word minister is very often used, and I like it. It's biblical. And, and then I came across you when I was pastoring in, in Berks County, and you were state rep, and you had this group, and you would get pastors and civil leaders together, and you said ministers together, and that they were trying to come together as authority from God in their different parts, and that's the, the, where we should be. Unfortunately, we see in history and we see in Scripture many cases where people didn't do that. I, I like to think of Ahab, King Ahab of Israel, uh, and his stinking thinking that he had. You know, he wanted a vineyard for himself. Oh, and Naboth says, no, I, this is my family's. I can't give it to you. And he goes home and he pouts. And his wife, who's even worse than him, says, well, just knock him off. You know, just be mafia, you know, and kill him and, and take it, which is exactly what he did, which is exactly opposite of a minister. This idea of ministering comes from administrating and serving. That's where that word, you know, for ministry and for minister comes. Um, and and uh, you have the second psalm um, uh, is just full of, of uh, good and bad. And you have the heathen that rage. Uh, you have the kings of the earth try to set themselves up against God. And it's a whole type of Ahab and Jezebel type of people. And that is, unfortunately, the natural tendency of man without the Word of God. Uh, but then you have, you know, what happens, and, and again, not time to get into it, but Psalm 2 is another good one to get into. Um, Sam, maybe some more uh, examples that you could give us, maybe a scripture or, or a historical example of uh, how God's purpose for government should work out. Well, I, I can, you know, the, the, the government as designed by God that will work out, frankly, <laughs> We're not going to see it until Jesus Christ comes back. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> and, and reigns from Jerusalem mm -hmm. because that is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what it's talking about. It's the millennial reign. Mm. That'll be the first time that we will have ever seen perfect government and perfect authority with perfect justice. 
Mm. Uh, we're going to have to wait for that because we're not right there yet, <laughs> yeah. uh, Isaac. But uh, but the, you know uh, the United States of America, as established by uh, the founders that we're talking about, got as close to that that model, and they did it by design of any nation. And as long as we were in the fear of God, walking in the ways of God, God has blessed this nation just like he said in Deuteronomy chapter 20, I'm going to make you the head, not the tail. I'm going to make you a lender, not a borrower. You shall be respected of the world. But at which point we as a nation said we don't need God, then Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15 kicks in. And God said, well then fine. You will be a borrower instead of a lender. You will no longer be respected and you will suffer need no longer prosperity. All of this is a part of God's plan. So much better to be a part of God's plan. And when we come back in just a moment, we'll complete uh, this emphasis on this principle, this eighth now in the series of 10 principles to national renewal. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Sam, as we come to the end of, of this important teaching that we've been going over, can, uh, can you kind of get us ready? We're, we're going to be done for the, the rest of this week. Um, can you kind of summarize it? Give us, you know, kind of that, uh, all right, one more time. Here we go. Summarize that and maybe connect it to where we're headed towards uh, in this. Yeah, I, 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 I can, Isaac, and, I, and, and I'll do it in this way. Um, these 10 principles mm -hmm. are right from the pages of Scripture. They were identified by our founders. They were preached from our pulpits. They were inculcated uh, in our homes. The principles of God's Word were taught. They would form the basis for our education system. Hmm. It, it were the laws that undergird our justice system. And it really functioned quite well. This country was never perfect because we're dealing with perfect people. <laughs> well, mm. And that actually is going to bring us to next week's uh, lesson because even though you do have people who, I, who are generally trying to fear God and keep His commandments and trying to put into place God's law, which has happened in this country, our three branches of government came off the pages of Scripture, and accountability came off the pages of Scripture, and, and we were teaching our Ten Commandments to kids. They were in the schools. We were praying to God in the schools. Um, and when we did, God blessed this nation and made us the head, not the tail. Mm. We became the shining city on a hill. Penn's prayer that Pennsylvania mm -hmm. would become the seed of a new nation happened. We got a new nation. But the lesson, Isaac, is that as we have walked away from God, we have walked away from God's blessings. And as we've walked away from God's blessings, freedom turns to bondage. Mm -hmm. Justice turns to injustice. And our courts begin to rule that that which is evil is good. Why do we think we have courts that have said that it's, killed, it's fine to kill babies in the womb? Yeah. Or it's fine for two men to marry each other instead of male and a female, as God said. Well, how, how does that happen? Because as a nation and as a people, we said we don't need God anymore. So, can God once again smile on our nation? Yeah, He can, but not until we return to Him and reacquaint ourselves with these principles, ladies and gentlemen, that come right from the pages of Scripture. So with that, I challenge you. Next week, we'll talk about building safeguards into the system, because even though you have good people in office, the sinful nature of man's heart is to still always err and go into sin. So safeguards have to be built. 
and we'll talk about that next. One of the identified 10 principles identified by our founders. Well, thanks again for watching and being with us today. Sure a privilege to be with you in your home and to have you a part of this and uh, continue to pray for us. We, uh, we urgently ask you to do that. We need your prayers. Uh, we need your help in finances so that we can take this information, put it in the hands of so many who need it. Maybe I've never seen it before. But for many, they need to be reminded God's ways are the best. Do what I say, God says, and I will bless you.